Um, all right, so welcome everyone to the Road to Mastery. This is a half day summit all about the future of content marketing. So where things have been, what things have changed and what we're gonna do about it. Uh, my name is Alex Burkett and I'm the co-founder of Omniscient Digital. I'm here with, with Ali. Uh, do you wanna do a little intro for yourself too? Yeah, hi y'all, my name's Ali. I've been on, I think one office hours. So I think I'm new to the event side of things at Omni. I'm excited to join you all today for the round table. Um, I am the other co-founder along with Alex and David, and I lead up our client success team. Nice, nice. All right. So as everybody's rolling in, we'd love to do a little icebreaker question. Uh, there's a chat on the right-hand sidebar. I think you have to click the icon at the bottom. But there should be a little red notification. If you could state your name where you're based and tell us, this is an icebreaker question. Well, actually, state your name where you're based, <laughs> your title and where Eric, you work. Maybe. Eric's typing already. He's ready. <laughs> <laughs> and then the icebreaker question today, uh, thank you, Carissa, is do you have the mind of an artist, a scientist, or both? And why? The classic marketer question. Uh-huh. What would it you is say, an interesting Alex? Question. Well, I ask it on the podcast all the time, and I don't think anybody's turned it on me. But I have a good blend. I would say I cater towards the scientific side, but I've been I've been trying to embrace more of the artistic side recently. I, I was actually mm -hmm. just at um uh, coffee with my friend Sophia this morning and we were talking about how we went horseback riding and I was like at first I tried to do this logical scientific I'm like oh, okay cool. this is the technique this is like how you stop and how you move forward and how you turn and all this yeah. stuff and then I realized halfway through I'm like that's fine but like it's actually a feel it's like a yeah. much more intuitive sense um yeah. And I'm noticing a lot of things are like that. Like I do jujitsu and it's like you, you do need to learn somewhat of the technique and like kind of yep. the the science behind it. But then once you're in the game, it's it's mostly intuitive feel. Yeah. So I'm trying to embrace more of that. Um, what about you? What would you say? I definitely got into writing and marketing from the creative side, just because it was a fun experience. Um, but now that I'm here, I want to make sure what I'm doing matters. So then I think I've become more of a scientist in that I care a lot about the data side, the results, like how to deliver value and all of that stuff because i don't think creativity can stand on its own at least in like a marketing sense but yeah the tech the the feel and technique thing is interesting because i feel like that in improv mm -hmm. uh sometimes i just want to get up there and do it but I, I the mechanics of it help me it almost frees me up to focus on the creative mm, yeah that makes sense i like that as like a the scientific layer is like the enablement or the process or the behind the scenes yeah. infrastructure because I feel like SEO has like this really interesting blend of both sides of the mind. And when yeah. I was working in experimentation, it was the same thing. It's like obvious, like you're literally following the scientific method. But at the end of the day, yeah. the real alpha and value comes from your creativity and like how you invoke yeah. creativity to form different experiences. Like there's no scientific deduction that can kind of create that value. It's kind of along the lines of like knowing the rules so you can break them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I yeah, feel yeah. Like artists typically break rules and enjoy it. Right, yeah, scientists like are like, jazz. No. Yes. <laughs> All right, cool. So I'm going to do a little intro for the show. So this is the Road to Mastery 2023. Again, I'm Alex and the co-founder of Omniscient Digital uh, with uh, my, my co-founder, Ali, head of content. Um, and today we're hosting a bunch of super smart, experienced folks in content marketing. We're discussing the current trends. There's obviously been a lot of talk about generative AI. There's layoffs. There are macroeconomic trends. There's a whole bunch of different things going on. That cause us to say, what's what's the new way to do content marketing? What's the way to do growth marketing nowadays? Yeah. Um, so we'll be talking about um, you know the impact of these things on how businesses create value, how they create engaging experiences that drive revenue. The agenda today, uh, it's multifold. It's all going to be interactive, uh, panel discussion oriented activities. So the first one we've got coming up is going to be the modern approach to B two B content marketing, and that's with Devin Bramhall. Anam Hussein, uh, Ali Orlando Wirt, and myself. And then we're going to take a quick break um, from learning to do a little enter entertainment. And that's going to be with uh, singer-songwriter Cousin Curtis. Um, so that's going to be a virtual live performance uh, from an award-winning uh, Root Stomp musician. So that'll be fun. And uh, then we've got a roundtable discussion called How to Win in B2B with Pep Laya, Kevin Indig, Ashley Foss, and Ali. 
this is going to be open to everybody. So, I, you know, with all of these panels, feel free to ask questions as well. And we mm -hmm. want to incorporate that into the into the show. Uh, and then finally, we're going to cap it off with an AMA uh, titled How to Be Remarkable in the Age of AI with Jay Akunzo. So that's the show. And then also something to announce here is that Straight North, a sponsor of this event, is giving away a $100 Amazon gift card to one live attendee. So we're going to announce the winner of that at the end of today's event. Awesome. All right. So that's basically Excited it. Ali, did in. you want to add anything or are we ready to kick off the show? One thing I'll say about the round table, and I will reiterate this when I come back on, um, if there's enough engagement from folks in the question module and some folks are asking multiple questions, we do have the option to open up uh, the floor per se for y'all to join us, camera on all of that to join the discussion. So if anybody is interested in doing that, we have a great lineup. You can let me know in the question module or just, I don't know, I might do it and hope that you join us. So just a heads up for how interactive we'll be later on. And that's the round table happening in a couple hours, hour and a half. You can jump in the hot seat, that'll be fun. Yeah, you should. Okay, well, I guess I will leave you here and the panel will begin, correct? All right, let's do the panel. Okay, bye y'all. All right, so just to reiterate as the panelists are coming in, the uh, panel is gonna cover um, any questions you have, but also the emergence of AI and concept marketing, the changing world of influencer marketing, micro-influencers, uh, in-person events, and why Devin hates playbooks. So that's going to be a big point of discussion, obviously. <laughs> Let me do a quick intro for everybody. Um, so first, Ali or Orlando Wirt's work in building a content strategy at a fast-growing SaaS company was recognized as the project of the year and best content marketing program by the Content Marketing Awards. From in-house to agency roles, Ali has continued to help companies develop audience-centric messaging and content strategies that deliver real results. She currently serves as the Senior Director of Content Strategy at Atfire. Anam Hussain started her career studying journalism and reporting for the Boston Globe. She pivoted to content marketing at HubSpot where she grew within the company for five years, hired me as a freelancer um, from startup to public, publicly traded company. Today, she is the head of content marketing at Reforge and CEO at Below the Fold, a twice a week email sharing uh, New email sharing news you aren't hearing anywhere else. Sorry, I can't read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Devin Bramhall uh, loves bicycling and spaghetti and meatballs and used to work at animals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. What else are you doing? You That's did a the greatest introduction I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> That's all that matters about me. I thought the interesting thing, I didn't know this until I read your bio, is that you were also the founder of The Master Slam, a poetry mm -hmm. uh, slam style debate about startups and tech. So I find that fascinating. I once got a bunch of VCs to pitch startup ideas that we created for them to startup founders in front of a giant room of people. I was like, that is, if that's not fun, like, I don't know what is. And they actually like had a blast doing it, so. That's awesome. It looks like we have a special guest too. This uh, looks like a cat here. Um, do we want to introduce your cat? Sure. This is Mao. Uh, Mao is named after a Bollywood dancer whose full name is Madhuri Dixit. So her name is Meowdhuri Dixit, but she goes by <laughs> Mao at home. Um, and after we travel, which we just did, she gets extra needy and cannot handle being alone. So she hops on every call. Um, so you'll see her popping in and out. <laughs> That's amazing. My dog might make a showing as well. We'll see if Biscuit shows up. <laughs> okay, so as we're discussing, um, if you all wanna ask questions for any of us specifically or just general topics that you want us to discuss, there's a questions mod module at the bottom and you can actually upvote and rank questions. So the, the top voted ones will get raised to the top and I'll be able to see them faster. So any, at any point through the show, uh, just make sure you ask those questions there. Um, I'm going to start out with a very high level question that we can all answer. Uh, what is your, what would you consider your marketing superpower? That's a big question, Alex. <laughs> I'm just going to ask a baby question that like gets to your soul and who you are, how you identify as a human. Like, oh God, what's yours? Um... Yeah, didn't see think how it would hard be that around is. on me this quickly. Uh, if you need time to think too, I can jump in. I feel like for me, I don't know like what to call it, but there is a form of content writing and editing I do that I actually think is a little different than how we think about content and writing and editing, and that 
And that's that it sits somewhere between a copywriter and a content marketer. I feel like you usually get someone who's a copywriter or you get someone who's a content marketer. And those are both very valuable uh, skill sets. And I feel like I have found over the past like 12 years how to sit in between those two and how to get those two to speak to another, how to give edits on both. And I actually, I think it's an underrated talent, but <clears throat> I'm very proud of myself for it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I love that. My mind was going a similar direction in that one of the things that um, I think has served me well over time is you, that actually when you ask the artist versus scientist question, I'm really obsessed with both. I love the creative process and creating the content, the you know creativity that goes into that. But I also just am absolutely obsessed with processes. I love building out foundational workflows and processes that are going to make people efficient and be able to do their best work. So um, I found it's very often people are really strong in one or the other, but being able to have a foot in both is really useful, especially in the content world. Totally. Ali, I might be the opposite of you. Ooh. <laughs> Like I would not in a, like in a complimentary way in that, like I've worked with, like I tend to surround myself with uh, people who are good at process because the thing, I think my superpower is also my like greatest need in life. So like I am terrible at following the rules. This is and why so we're going to have a debate about playbooks, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 I always, I believe in learning the wheel before you break the wheel. But like, once I understand the wheel, I like can't, there's something inside me that just, cannot stand operating it that way. I'm like, what if you do like this, you know, what if you make it a square? Like, could that work? And I think that that like mindset has led me to some creative approaches and solutions. It's like my intolerance for doing them th the same thing twice kind of is exhausting. Yeah. But also it means that every time I look at a new problem, I'm like, oh, what if we, you know, like I kind of look at it uniquely, which usually leads to doing things a little bit different, which is sometimes a good thing. And sometimes <laughs> right, right. I think I resonate more with that. And I did think on mine, and I think mine might be that I'm delusional uh, to, a, to an extent, I think. So one, one of the best, and Ali and David would definitely agree with this, like I have, um, a lot of belief in things that we can accomplish. And one of the best pieces of feedback that I got at HubSpot was in like our peer reviews. One of my colleagues was like, working with Alex makes me feel like anything's possible. And oftentimes like the thing is, is probably not possible, but I look at things and I'm like, like, why couldn't we do that? Or like, why couldn't it be in this time frame? And I always feel like, I don't know, I think most things are more possible than we, when, than we imagine. Um, so I think that's, that's been pretty valuable. Um, What's something that you've changed your mind on about content marketing recently? God, you're really going deep, man. <laughs> I Ooh. thought these were going to be the easy starter questions. <laughs> I don't think blogs matter that much anymore, nor do I even believe in websites. Interesting. Big, big change. Do, do you want to explain that? <laughs> I don't, do you want me to? Probably not. <laughs> no, I'd love to hear. The website is more surprising to me than the blog. I can I mean, infer the blog because website. social media like maybe is. Sort of like, that's how you show that you exist in the world, right? Like it's sort of like, it's like real estate. You know, if you're not a business unless you list on Google because otherwise no one's going to believe that you are like um, legit. But I... The blog post thing, like, I just think that is a medium that's not, um, it was like the be all end all for a while in terms of like, it was the foundation of organic traffic growth. And now I think that because there is so much, so many different places to experience, to gain knowledge and the type of knowledge that's interesting to most people now is more on the, what I think a lot of people are calling a thought leadership, which is just like really bespoke ideas that are drilled into deeply and that's like a big differentiator that like the kind of stuff that you put that's on a blog now is more like you know um baseline education in the area that you're in but it's not the thing that makes you stand out necessarily again broad strokes here right um and i think websites like even for me personally like animals didn't grow because of our website animals didn't grow i haven't I don't even have a website. I, no one even barely knows what I do. And I've been busy with work since I left. And so I think, and it's because of the, the approach that I took. And so I think there's just like, 
if we stop thinking about that as the center of everything, I think there actually is like some pretty interesting untapped opportunity if we just changed our mindset a little bit away from that thing, which I know is like, just someone tear that apart. <laughs> some I, think, shit here. I, I think, no, I think it's really interesting. I think I'm with you on blogs because I think blogs vary from company to company. And so depending on what, where, like where a blog fits, and there's so many factors there. The website one is interesting because I think my learning is actually the opposite over the past year. So I joined uh, Reforge in December of 2021. And our website was the same Squarespace website that our CEO made in like whenever he started the company six years ago. And we were as a company very much like, it's just a website. Like, does anyone care about websites? Like who cares about them, right? We, we found over that year is that our customers can or our prospects continue to not know who we were once we got out of the early adopters so like we had like our, our ceo's name is brian balfour <clears throat> he has a really sorry i'm fasting so i can't drink water i gotta clear my throat um so our our ceo has like a really large network and anyone who is in his network they all knew exactly what reforge did but by the time i joined it was like the first time the marketing team was established and we had to like break out of our early adopters nobody understood what we were doing and we found that like our email became our website and our emails got like longer and longer and longer and then we had like an faq email that had to go in every single campaign because we heard all these questions over and over again and also the unique thing about us is that we didn't have a sales team, right? So we don't have people that you're like getting on the phone with who could answer your questions. And so we are like directly talking to consumers. And so we found from that, um, that is the audio cutting for me? Or can you guys hear me? Okay. Oh, good. Okay, cool. Uh, so we found that like our website actually ended up being a huge barrier to our success. And so we ended up spending six months investing and relaunching it. And as of January, we launched it. And we are seeing for us, again, because we were out of that early adopter phase and now like in the internet strangers phase, we found that the website really started to do the educational work that we were lacking and that our emails our emails are performing better because we got to take all that extra junk out of it and let the website talk for itself. So we've had like a little bit of a different learning, but I was in Devin's camp until this experience. Interesting. Um, Ali, is the the blog dead? Is the website dead? No, I don't think so. And I'm processing. So good. You're going to get a whole range of opinions here. So I'm, I'm, I'm like a mo on all things in moderation kind of person. So I, I love what you said, Devin, about like, you have to build the wheel before you break it. And I think that building a good foundation first and like trying out some of the tried and true proven methods is a good starting point. And then you learn and test and optimize like what's going to work for your business and what isn't. And I have seen, I have a very fresh example in my mind of companies that sort of skipped over the foundational part of like building an SEO engine, building a blog, learning how to put out like really good educational content that builds an audience, a subscriber list, all of that good stuff and kind of jumped over that to like, let's jump right to like thought leadership and something that's super different and like really um, kind of separate from our main company brand. And it sort of struggled because the foundation wasn't there first. It was difficult for people to attach that thought leadership thing back to like the company and what the company did. And when you went to the company website, the website wasn't good. There wasn't a blog. There wasn't a lot of educational content there. And so I got that one just kind of like fresh in my mind in terms of like, you know, I really want the foundation there first. Let's get good at like educating people, have a really strong SEO strategy. Once we've got that, like just flowing in a good groove, then we say, okay, now how do we break the wheel? Like, what's the other thing? What's the, how do we elevate it? How do we build that leadership? But I think, I think it's, for me, it's a both, not an either or. I mean, also like any blanket statement is going to be wrong, right? Like anytime you say anything that applies to everything, it's wrong. But I will say that like one of the companies that I worked with last fall was um, they sell a, a tool that they sell to CFOs and their founders, founder was, um, He's like, I don't even want a website. Like we don't even, they, he put up a website because he was basically forced because they're like the type of thing, like the people who are searching for a product like ours aren't doing it online. They don't, they're not going to read a blog. Like they didn't even have a blog. They were like, this is pointless. There's absolutely, like, we do not need this. They had strong relationships in the industry already. And so the kind of content that we helped design for them was like a research report 
we invented like a, a CFO series of like dinners and things, you know, it was like that approach, like they were truly a company that just didn't need a website. They had it there to like show they had a pulse. And I think that there's like with these industries that are coming up now, like all the ones that were content focused, like, you know, Envision and like all these, you know, MarTech companies, some of these new industries around like FinTech, InsurTech, all of that, like it's true. They don't like insurance guys like aren't going on the web to find things. And as you target like more niche industries or higher level folks, it is like, it does, you know, you maybe don't need that foundation in the same way. It feels like, I mean, if we deleted our website as an agency, I don't think it would be that big of a deal. We we would lose a couple leads, but like we can do most of our stuff in person or by doing thought leadership. But like, I feel like when it comes to scalability, one of the ultimate channels, at least through throughout my career has been SEO. So doing content, the underpinning of that has been to build organic traffic, to convert that traffic either to an email list, a lead, revenue, whatever the business model kind of suggests. So in absence of a website and blog being the centerpiece, I would imagine that SEO, like, how do you, Devin, how do you feel about SEO as like the underpinning of your content strategy? Is that also... I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Like, I don't think it's an automatic, like everyone needs SEO as the foundation of their strategy. That's just not correct. But I've like, I believe in all the tools that are currently being deployed in content marketing, including paid channels, right? Like I believe in all of it, but I think that, oh my God, this is why I can't be on in public talking about things. (laughs) I think that like (laughs) word of mouth, is the new SEO. Like, sorry, it's way stickier. It lasts forever. It is not, it is based on relationships, which like you guys just talking about, you're like, I used to freelance for, uh, I used to, you freelance for- Freelance for the sidekick team, yeah. Yeah, and then she led you to meet David. Like, yeah, that's how, like that, and so- I just think that, um, yes, SEO is obviously still important. All the foundational things we do are still building journeys, all those things. But I just don't take it as like a given. Right, right. That's really good. I would agree with that, Devin. I think that is a really good point. And it's not like I see in the chat a couple of people asked, like, what would you do instead? And I can think I like I had an example where I started with the traditional, like, let's do SEO, let's do the blog. And it was an industry where it did not work well. It was a very, very word of mouth heavy industry. I was in the education market, school districts. They all just talk to each other to find out like what the other districts are doing. They're not Googling stuff because they all already have solutions in place, whether they're good or not. And so that did not do well for us. And so we turned to things like having a really strong um, event presence. How do we show up at these industry events? What's the story? How are we getting excitement and buzz? Like what's our PR and communication strategy? And then also like building a referral program. How do we take these customers who love us and like supercharge that out into the market? But it was it became way more about that kind of stuff than SEO and blogging. Yeah, it's like, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. I had someone asked me the other day about event strategy and I was like, well, what are you doing at these events? They're like, well, we have a table. I'm like, guess what? You have a table in a room with hundreds of other companies where like the only thing you can do to stand out is like offer them a beer or like a bullet coffee or whatever is the, you know, startup bros. Or- free drinks do well though. Free free drinks do very well at conferences. Yeah. Like I went to <laughs> the, whatever the web summit in like Portugal and they like had swings and I was like, cool. I'm going to sit on the swing for hours. You can come to me if you want, but like, this is where I'll be. Right. <laughs> I'm like, that's not authentic. It's not related to your brand. And so it's like, I was like, okay, cool. If you want an event strategy and that's where all your people are, have a super exclusive dinner yeah. with 10 people. Take them to the best restaurant. You could spend $5,000 on one dinner and it's going to cost you a fraction of sitting at that dumb table, acting all thirsty, trying to get people to come talk to you. It's like, it doesn't... Right, right. So I'm, I promise I'm going to ask some of the questions from the audience here, but I think this is a good transition point. And um, I wanted to ask you, uh, because you were early on at HubSpot and I was at HubSpot too. Hubs- and people look at HubSpot as this uh, model to replicate inventing inbound marketing, 100 million visits, well, however many visits they have, they just a ton of traffic. But it's heavily been built on SEO. Like at least when I was there, it was heavily SEO focused. My question is, is would this work today? Like if HubSpot were starting from scratch in 2023 with none of the advantages built up cumulatively over time, what would the content approach look like for HubSpot today? 
Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack here related to your question, related to what was shared previously. Um, so when I first joined, um, like when I first joined like any consulting contract, any freelance contract, even a full-time gig, the number one thing people want to see based on my background is like create the HubSpot thing here, right? Like that's what everyone's always asking for. A lot of the job offers I get, I'm like, what do you actually want me to do? And then I hear that and I'm like, okay, thank you. But I already did that. Um, and so what, what I find is that a lot of people just want to see the success and what they didn't see was the work that went into making that. It's, it's so easy to look at it and be like, okay, they published a ton of content and they ranked, but really we were publishing five posts a day. Sometimes we were like doing a ton of news jacking. Like if, if a social media algorithm came out with a new update, like there were times where I'd be no joke at the office till like 6 a.m. because I was like, I need to be the first one to publish on this topic, right? So it was like, it wasn't just that we were publishing a lot. It was that we were publishing highly relevant content for our audience, news jacking every topic. We knew our, our persona so well. I've never worked in a company that knew their persona as deeply as we did. Like when we held a conference, it was like, who, what, who, like what artist is coming that like marketing Mary would listen to? Like it was literally everything was about this persona. And so you had all those things going for you, plus no one else was doing it. <laughs> so like <clears throat> there were so many factors that went into what work. Now today, I don't think that a publishing volume is necessarily the goal. Um, today, I think that SEO is so different than when it was then, like even HubSpot's had to completely evolve their strategy. So many brands have gone through and it used to be that you covered just about every topic on the face of the internet. And now it's like, actually, you need to show an expertise, expertise in a certain radius of topics. And so they've like deleted content or they've redirected content and they're actually trying to show, we only want you to find us for these things, which is that's how they're growing. So all in all, I don't think the HubSpot playbook would translate today, but I think there's a ton in that playbook that's really valuable. Like, how do you think about new topics that emerge? How do you really only focus on the audience that matters to you? But there's some mechanics there that also wouldn't work today. So, for example, we not only published five times a day, you could get five emails from us. You got an email every single time one of those posts went live. And now like email is overloaded with stuff and there's like, it's impossible for you to do that. So for on our end at Reforge, we actually are starting to see after a lot of changes, I won't go into every detail, but we are starting to see publishing volume increases start to benefit us. But our constraint is that we can't email more than once a week, right? So how many pieces can you include in that? And if you create more, are you actually just separating your traffic across a bunch of work versus keeping attention on one or two posts? So there are some additional constraints that exist today. There's not as much social interest. There's way too much going on. There's not as much email real estate you can take over. Um, and so I think all that's changed. I personally do see a ton of value in SEO still. I think you have it in your notes. I had said that I see it, SEO as a, at the core of a strategy. And the reason is because I spent eight months at Reforge working with like the best content. We have all these amazing experts from all these different senior product level companies and roles who like shared their deepest wisdom and playbooks with us. And after the first like month that it just goes into a graveyard. Like it goes into a graveyard of content that doesn't get discovered anymore. And so we've actually, re we started a whole new SEO playbook in January of this year. And so we only have directional insight, but basically we're trying to figure out how can you marry unique thought leadership that is very different from everything you see on the internet with actually making sure that content gets discovered, which is actually a very difficult challenge. Yeah. And so we are um, trying to figure out a way to do that really effectively. And um, and so there are parts of the HubSpot playbook that I think really works, but there are parts that don't. I know people are mentioning AREFs. We're definitely using all the different tools, but if you just follow AREFs, you're gonna write just the same content that every, you're gonna just have copycat content and no one needs you to say what's already stated on the internet. And so finding it in a unique way, I think is actually really difficult to do. That, I mean, you touched on something interesting, which is that combination of maybe thought leadership and SEO as a distribution channel, which, my co-founder, Ali, calls hybrid content, and I think that is the future because something we talk about often is tools lowering the barrier to entry or the cost of competition. So it's like Ahrefs, SEMrush, like you've got all the same keyword data. So like how can you find keywords that are rising in popularity that aren't representative in those platforms? And then you've got Clear Scope and Surfer that give you a content brief and kind of like reverse engineer all the stuff that the other people are doing. And now you've got ChatGPT and generative AI that can get you 
you know, a 60, 70% done draft. And it's like, once all of those things are accounted for, everybody can do them. What's the additional value add that, that you are differentiated on? Ali, did you have any thoughts on HubSpot's playbook from 10 I years ago? Like my head's falling off from nodding along so vigorously. I love <laughs> it. And I was so interested to hear that, that whole story. I worked at a HubSpot agency for a couple of years, so we followed the HubSpot playbook pretty closely. But um, no, I love, I love everything you shared. It's really resonating with me, that piece of the SEO is super important. We have to, it also like reveals to us in some ways what our audience is searching for and what they care about. And it's how we make sure it doesn't go into a graveyard. So it's absolutely important. But then this is how, I know we're gonna talk at some point about like AI. This is how we differentiate ourselves from AI. Anybody can track the keywords and then put out something that like aligns to the keywords, but how we bring a unique point of view to it, something that elevates it, differentiates it from the noise that's already out there. That's the thought leadership piece. I know somebody in the chat said, can we define thought leadership? And we probably all have a different take on that. But I think um, where we bring a unique story and angle and perspective, make people think differently about things than they maybe thought about them about that before, then that's, that's a part of the thought leadership that I think of there. Yeah, I wanted to ask that next. I love <laughs> definition questions because I think for marketers, we look at ourselves as word people often, but I feel like we're very loose with the words we use. Like I was talking to my co-founders the other day, I'm like, what the hell is lead nurturing? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> what, is, what does nurturing actually mean? Um, so can someone from the panel define thought leadership? I, okay. So first of all, I was just recommending Erin Balsa's podcast because what I think is really cool about her, talk about like finding a niche, is she, she brings on guests every episode and she asks them, how do you define thought leadership? And I think it's a really cool idea because it's like, I was, I was on it as well. And I was listening to it to prepare. And it's like, everybody has a sort of different uh, idea of what it means. Um, and so I think that's a really fun way to sort of like immerse yourself in that. I don't think that thought leadership, defining thought leadership really matters that much. What I see in this, like this sort of new evolution, evolution of content marketing and SEO and the fact that like social media for B2B SaaS companies doesn't work anymore um, from like a brand level, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think there's this, I don't know how to define it yet. And speaking of trying to figure out being difficult, like I've been trying to write this talk forever, but it's like this whole concept of like idea based marketing or like mini campaigns where instead of thinking about things that of, um, so thinking about like, keywords and or like product it's like okay what is our unique idea about the space that we operate in you know the why behind the product like what got us here and creating like little mini campaigns around ideas that deploy multiple different tactics right it might in include seo it might include you know even social or email strategy or whatever um but because it's based around an idea it inherently involves um, like the asset, like specific SMEs and in, in narrowing it down by idea and human, it actually creates the foundation of a richer approach because now you're thinking about brand building around a small group of people who can then go off in their communities and they're more believable because they're not the brand, they're themselves deep in these communities. And, you know, the way that you marry that with thought leadership, um, in terms of like talks that they're giving, you know, pitches that they're giving to the press, um, in addition to the SEO content that you have on your website, which is both like, you know, SEO optimized and um, has really hot takes, you know, it has that like unique perspective within it, even though you've optimized it for search. Like, I think that to me is something I've been trying to like map out for a while, because I think that that can be, um, it allows you to go deep and broad, but instead of focusing on like one team to do it, the marketing team then becomes the facilitators of this across the organization where you're like, you're now leaning on multiple departments to market the organization in a more organic way that potentially has greater impact because you're leaning on people's following and narrow ideas um, behind the product. Let me, let me inter interject real quick because that idea is cool. That the, well, the idea of ideas. Um, <laughs> But we, we've been calling this the brand POV. Uh, so it's like, I was talking to Ronnie Higgins, who is a friend of Omniscient. He's been on the pod a bunch and done events with us. And he's he's got so many interesting models. Like I hung out with him in San Francisco and 
just the ideas that come out of, out of that man's brain. Um, but he was trying to define what this brand POV concept is. And he's like, well, it's, it's like if your brand hosted a cocktail party, who would be invited? Obviously, it's your target audience. Your target audience is there. Like, what are they talking about? What, what are the topics uh, du jour? And then how, do you, how does your brand feel about those topics? And I was like, oh, that's a good way to encapsulate what your POV is. Because then you can choose the distribution channels and the formats that are conducive to reaching those people. But before you know that, it's hard to have that differentiated angle. Yeah. So um, um, Anum, what is your take on thought leadership? So we do have a definition of thought leadership at Reforge. And for us, it's well, not like a specific definition, but for us, it's very much about like, how are we synthesizing introducing it into a framework or a way that you can learn about it. That said, I do not think most of what you see on blogs today is thought leadership, right? Like we have a specific formula we use, like our programs are based off of it. It's like what our business is. So that's why we have a definition. But if that wasn't the case, if we were a completely different business, we probably wouldn't. And I think it's, I think as content people, anyone on this call, we like probably have a love hate relationship with the term thought leaders. And I think it's because like, what does it mean to be like, a leader of thoughts, right? Like, I think you have to really think about what space are you in? What do you cut your customers care about? And then how do you deliver that? Like earlier, we talked about for some people, events and trade shows work for us. Uh, like our webinars are not our best way of um, communicating with our customers. We find that it's not a tool that really works for us. But again, our content, because it's this thought leadership specific definition to our company where we're synthesizing insights from experts and turning their content, their insights into a framework. We have a thought leadership formula that works for us. Um, and so the other, other channels don't work as great for us because we haven't cracked that. But so I think it's really easy to be like, oh, we have to be doing thought leadership. What you really should be doing is figuring out what is the actual content that our customers are interested in and then in what format, because there's so many different formats that can exist in. And we haven't talked about newsletters yet, but like newsletters is a whole big one. I ran a newsletter for three years, no blog, didn't care about the website. All you could do on that was just subscribe to the newsletter. Um, and so I think there's like, really a lot of internal thinking you have to do when you see these playbooks or information online and think about what makes sense for your business based off of the conversion systems you want. I love that. And Ali, what do you think about thought leadership? I think I, I gave my, uh, my little spiel not too long ago. Um, I think it's bringing a unique story and perspective, differentiating and how you're going to bring value to that topic from how everyone else is doing it. Um, I don't have I don't have a strict definition for it or documented or anything though. So now you've got my wheel spinning. Maybe maybe we will. <laughs> it was hard to define. I always thought of it as an immersion property, not necessarily a format or a distribution channel. Like I always thought of it as a result of of. It's like the cumulative effect of somebody looking at you as a thought leader, and maybe there's like a metric you could put behind that. But I think it's something that happens from all of the content you're doing. It's not like you choose to do thought leadership you become a thought leader through all of the things. That yeah, you, I think you that's fair. And I, I've also like, I think I've shifted my focus over the years from like less of a concern about thought leadership and more towards the idea of audience building. Because if you're doing a good job becoming a thought leader, or even in some cases, positioning your customer as the thought leader, maybe you're, maybe the goal isn't to make yourself the thought leader. Maybe it's to make your your customers the thought leader. Mm -hmm. um, what you're doing over time is is building an audience of people who have found value and something unique with you that they can't get anywhere else. So I focus on that piece of it a little bit more. Cool. I love that. We've talked a lot about foundations here, actually, of content strategy. And we do have a question that's around the core components of content marketing in the emerging digital space. And something that, Al, you would, you would um, put on the intake forum was that you're passionate about, about, passionate about building out strong foundational content strategy before getting distracted by shiny objects. So I was wondering if we could, you know, maybe define what foundations need to be in place? What, what does a strong foundational content strategy look like? You want me to start? Yeah. All right. Oh, that's a good question. Um, for me, this is a part I am super passionate about. And now maybe I will make Devin happy in that I have broken the wheel on this one. I do not like mapping um, content strategies to the traditional funnel or any kind of linear buyer's journey. I feel super passionately about that. And so um, I use a different framework that's all about audience needs and sitting down and mapping out who's our audience. Um, like like Anam said, making sure we understand our persona so deeply and what are the informational needs 
or content needs that they have at any given point in time. I don't care if they're in the beginning, the middle or the bottom of our like imaginary journey that we want to force them through. Like I want to know what our audience cares about and how we can meet those needs. That for me is like the absolute foundation. And I don't want to talk about distribution strategies or SEO versus, you know, other channels or tactics until we have like, and just always kind of bringing it back to that. What is, what are the audience needs and shifting the lens? Cause I think it is so easy, especially like if we're in a organization with lots of parts of marketing, maybe you're working with like a demand generation team and you know, there's all of these pressures on marketing to deliver leads and revenue. And of course that is a huge part of what content does. And we play a part in that, but it's really easy to get, Kind of focused in on ourselves and our goals and the journey we want them to take instead of like i feel like content plays that super important role of always bringing it back to like yeah but what's what are we doing for our audience like what's in it for them if we come at it with that mindset we're going to ultimately get the results from it that we want nice and i'm uh <laughs> what do you think about the foundational components of strategy you mentioned personas before with hubspot mm -hmm. Or on him. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. He's asking me. Um, so, yeah, I've mentioned personas before. Honestly, <clears throat> we don't really strongly tie to a funnel, but anytime things start to go wrong, all right, let's just like take a step back. <laughs> it's like just like such a universally understood way of looking at it. It's not like, you know, our whole thing at Reforge is growth loops, not funnels. So, we're not like naturally using them very often. It's only when things start to like, crack or break or things get confusing where sometimes the funnel view can just help, especially non-marketers understand what you're talking about. Like that is the time where I've brought it up the most is when I have a presentation to the rest of the company and I need finance or HR or product or whoever. Sometimes it's just helpful to be like, this is what it would look like in a funnel. And this is what we're talking about. But within our team, we don't really on the marketing team really think about it as a funnel. Yeah. The funnel's not cool anymore. We have the flywheel, the growth loop, the content playground funnels are out. It's a good, it's a good call out though. Like if you're talking with your sales team, they, they start thinking in terms of the funnel. So like use the language of your internal audiences as well. When it's helpful. It's a good totally. Point. Devin, what do you think? I mean, uh, when I think about foundation, I think a little bit, um, like everything we're talking about is like, to me makes perfect sense, right? It's all logical, but <clears throat> I think one thing that comes up over and over among the marketers that I hear from and certainly me myself at various companies and working with other companies on marketing is the foundation is, may we please execute a marketing strategy? And can we have more than like one to two months, one to three months before something is forced upon us, some change is forced upon us and we can't do it anymore or like without people meddling. Like, I think that's a really important it's one of those things that nobody talks about out loud because it's like so foundational to our lives as marketers that we just don't even think to bring it up. But I'm like, I think that we, that, uh, we could be in a very, in a much more interesting and place and have a lot more, uh, options available to us. If we spend more time focusing on the, the work and less time focusing on, trying to be allowed to do the work and then mm. not having to resell it consistently over and over and over again. Right. And I think that like from small companies to large corporations that I've worked with, like it's this, it's surprising how frequently that story comes through. And I think that that's an important, like you want to talk about like the modern marketing strategy. It's like, let's everybody get on board with marketing. And stop pretending like you know anything about how to do it. You don't. Just like go, like, I, you know, I don't know. I couldn't run a finance team, right? And I think that is hurting progress. I think it is, like, it does sort of create a situation in which, like, I think we're sort of in the doldrums right now. I think we could be on the cusp of some really interesting stuff. But, like, over and over again, the clients I work with, it's like, it's the same problem. And so, you know, I agree with everything that you all have said. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. The biggest problem is being able to execute long enough to learn anything and find the right approach. I, I think that resonates so much. Uh, you're, you're talking about like you, you actually have to commit to the direction to actually see a payoff. I, I think that's something I saw everyone's head, head nodding there. Like that's <laughs> in content, and, especially, and I feel like you're always it. changing directions and you're like, oh, yeah. we're not seeing results here. But it's like you've been doing it for two months and it's SEO and it takes, you know, it's like, what if we just committed to the direction that we chose? Yep. I just yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. I think <clears throat> with content, 
there, I feel like at every company with content marketing, there's this like, and I I maybe HubSpot's to blame, but there's like the scrutiny around like, as soon as you start doing it, there should be a value right away. And really like you need six months in any strategy to know if it's directionally working or not. Like, I think obviously you can get directional insight sooner and that's like good, but like to get to the, the bigger stuff, you actually need to commit to a strategy and give it some time before like making broad sweeping changes, changing people's roles, all that sort of stuff. But I see it happen way too often as exec just gets like impatient with the results they want to see. Totally. Um, so we've gone like third, 40, 40 minutes without talking about AI. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I think we should talk about shiny objects now because we did get a question about that. Um, so let's address the elephant in the room. And uh, is ChatGPT going to uh, take all our jobs? You know, that's not the right question to ask. Hmm. But I'm That's framing a boring it. question. <laughs> like, What's who, a better question, Devin? Who cares? Like, well, because also, like, because it misses all the like innovation that's possible with a new technology. Like, I don't know what it is about this. Okay, first of all, this is not the first time this question has been asked, which is why I'm tired of it. Back when I worked in customer, I worked for Help Scout and we marketed to customer support folks chatbots were coming up and everybody was like, Oh my God, chatbots, like they're going to take our jobs, like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, how about they're making making the boring parts of your job. Like they're taking on the boring parts of your job. So you can spend your time on the most complex issues that, you know, a robot can't answer. And I think that like the exciting and scary things about AI are like, yes, AI was able to convince, you know, a task rabbit that, they were like they were able to like identify that they could lie and that they needed to lie to get their way and convince someone to do something for them or whatever. But the flip side of that, and you know, it's taking artists' work or whatever that whole problem. But like the other side of that is like, imagine what you could do. Like, there's this whole world. Like, we haven't even scratched the surface of how to utilize it. Like, my biggest problem with AI right now is I'm like, I don't think I know how to ask the right questions to like get interesting stuff from it. Because mm. I just like that's that's going to become a skill. You know, it's like research is suddenly going to be this new field because like researchers know how to ask like structure questions to get the like the the output that they're looking for, the type of output. Right. Um, so I think that like from an artistic state, like once the, the you know, certain artists like latch onto this and they start innovating on it and us as marketers start coming up with weird ideas and seeing what happens like that's when I think it's going to start to get interesting, but we're never going to get there. If we sit, if we like navel gaze, like, what about my job? Like ask a better question. How can you use this to differentiate yourself as a marketer by coming up with some brilliant idea that I am not smart enough to come up with. Right. It's like position yourself on top of it. Like every time there's a major change in the world, the people that like take the time to like embrace it as long as it's like safe and not mean or whatever, you know, they see the opportunity and they're like, I can transform my business. I can create a whole new line of business using this. Like that to me is a more interesting question. This is like, I really like the people who are sharing examples of how they're testing it and seeing what's possible. Um, because I'm like, not, I need those examples. Like I don't even know how to bang on it. I'm just like, this seems cool. <laughs> yeah. I see your point. I just uh, use chat GPT to suggest me a list of better questions I can ask next time. So that was beautiful. Um, so let's assume. I like the question. (laughs) (laughs) All right. What's your take? Because to the point you said, Devin, you're hearing it a lot and you're kind of tired of it. And so I think it's actually like, let's start, like, why not bring up the elephant in the room? I agree. It's not like, I don't think that there are probably many of us that are actually afraid that chat GPT is going to take our jobs. So in that respect, like maybe we think it's a dumb question, but the reality is that like people outside of marketing might be asking that question. And like our bosses might be asking that question. Our boss's bosses might be asking that question. Like, and that's why I love what Devin said. Like, let's be on top of it and ahead of it before somebody else comes to us and says, Hey, couldn't I get like AI to do your job? Like you don't want to be caught in that position where someone else is coming to you, like be in front of it, be ahead of it and be like, we're already all over it. We're testing it. We're experimenting with it. This is how our team's figured out the most strategic best way to use it. Like, but don't get caught flat footed on it. It's like the HubSpot approach, right? Like, you know, they're like news jacket to your benefit by like using it and trying it and then telling everyone about it. Like that's, 
Yeah. And, and I love what you said there too, Ali, about like, if you don't know, like, cause we've definitely had, I, I've definitely seen people and people have come to me where folks have come to them and be like, well, can't chat GPT, just do this. And if you haven't used the tool and you don't know how to use it, then you don't have a good answer to that. And your instinct is just be like, no, of course not. But you, what you want to be able to come back and say, is like, well, actually I find that it's helping improve my writer's block, or I found that it's helping me like summarize these thoughts or clean up my notes or whatever you can do. I think where it exists today is like, it's fun, it's cool. But I think the future implications are really interesting. I think the resistance that I see on my team, I try to, I think it's very similar to like the resistance of getting your team onto Asana and getting them to follow like an Asana project. It's like the same thing. It's like, no, it's cool. Like it's in my head and it's like, okay, but it's not in everyone's head. Like this will make us all operate faster. And so I think it's more of a right now, I think it's a productivity tool and that's where I see it growing. And I think that's where it's going to get really interesting. So for example, I'm like also the chief editor for all the work that goes out and I make the same damn edits like over and over and over again. And I get it when you go as a content marketer from company to company, you have to adjust to a new voice, a new writing style, a new set of guides, uh, editorial guidelines. But imagine if you could like train AI to just know this is what our editorial guidelines are. And this is what like our company's brand voice is. And now like everything that you publish goes through that. That doesn't mean that you aren't still going to need the copywriter who understands the brand and sets that tone and trains that vision. But having it to give that tool, I think would be really helpful. And then I think it's also going to create jobs. Like we have <clears throat> Salesforce admins, you have like iterable experts, you have like people who only use HubSpot, like eventually you're probably going to need that person on your MarTech stack that knows the AI tools really, really well. And like, that's what they live and breathe and they make it easier for the whole team and enable your whole team in like a marketing ops way. Yeah. That's such a good point. Like there's a, there's a whole role for someone to set this up in the, in the company, like at animals, we were starting to conduct experiments using AI. Cause we were like, okay, we're content agencies. Like we got to figure out how this works. We just figure out what to do with it. So we were just, we were doing all, you know, we were just about to start all kinds of experiments and on it, quite honestly, because I'm terrible at setting up anything that's like scientific or, you know, logical. I'm I, the first person I go to, I'd be like, Hey, Allie, you're really good at this. Can you figure out a way, like, can you be our R and D on AI? Right? Like this is something that like, you'd be the first one I go to for like creative exploration because of your abilities to um, invent process. Like you would be the most creative mind for me in that way because Right. I'm like, I don't even like I look at it. And I'm like, I want to I want to try this. But I just keep going back to um, what's it called? The the image one. Um, Mid journey. Huh? Dolly. Dolly. Yeah. And I just keep putting weird prompts in about like mm -hmm. monsters and coming up with these really cute, fuzzy monster guys that like P.S. I wanted to put in our podcast website. And Margaret was like, absolutely not. That's weird. But like, that's where I'm like, I just want to play with pictures where it's like. <laughs> Someone <laughs> who's more, you know, who can think creatively and scientifically would be the right person to help discover or set up a way to, for discovery. I think and that is the way. Oh, go sorry, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, if you want to respond to that, I'm going to add. Oh, I was just going to say the, the thing is with these tools, I actually think treating it like a playground right now is the right way to learn them. Because I didn't understand them at all when I first started using Jasper. And I was like, oh, it can just write me a whole blog post. And. Sure enough, it, it can't, it's not great. But then I started doing silly stuff like images and I would write like love letters and in the style of like old poets. And <laughs> you know, you, you describe like a friend or something and you're like, hey, write like a Hunter S. Thompson whiskey fueled essay about this person. And it, it does cool stuff. So I just treated it like a toy. And now I'm like, oh, I kind of understand the constraints and where I could use this. So I think treating it like a sandbox is, is probably ideal right now, actually. Yeah, we also started by using it as a toy, like around the holidays, we were like, oh, chat GPT, like describe Reforge in the tune of like Jingle Bell Rock or something, right? And yeah. you get like some cute songs back and things like that. Um, well, actually, I'm really curious. I haven't checked out Jasper's um, LinkedIn today to see if they've addressed anything, but I wanted to add the US Copyright Office just came out with some information. I don't know if anyone saw it, but I'm going to read it. It says, 
If you're using generative AI tools to create content, articles, blog, posts, books, images, software, songs, videos, you do not own that content according to their office. That means that anyone can reproduce it without your permission, create derivative work from it, display it, perform it, and sell it. And so I think this is going to get really interesting. And for anyone who has been told, like, can AI just do the job? Like, you can just be like, well, then under US law, that's not like company owned content. Um, and so I think it's going to get really interesting to see how these laws evolve. But I think it's a like, I think it's a really interesting introduction to the whole conversation of like, is AI going to replace jobs? And I think what the government here is saying is like, no. Wow. That's fascinating. That's Breaking news. We used to we say news jacked like news jacking this event. <laughs> We used to think about copying like a help scout because sometimes people will copy us like pretty identically. And mm -hmm. our decision on that was just like, we're great then. Like if, mm -hmm. if we're going to be copied, then we're great. And I feel like that introduces like even more of an angle to that where it's like, you know, you do something and then you just start to see the copycats, you feel flattered. But if AI is making it and you're just caught, it's like derivatives of the same uh, fabricated thing. You're like, Oh, this is kind of, does that, does that come, like, does that boil everything down to the same thing everywhere eventually? Like if you're copying a copy generated by something that's already just blowing the ocean of what exists already, hmm. what is that? Are we going to live in that? Like, I don't know. Is it going to be like, <laughs> not to get too um, cynical, but I think that's how SEO content was done in many spaces before AI was a thing. <laughs> well, Google, I remember this was in like, so I studied journalism, as you guys heard. So when I was still in my journalism phase and working the Boston Globe, I did like the online news association has this like annual news conference. And I was in their student newsroom and someone from Google. And I remember as he was saying it, I was like, bro, no one's going to follow this. And that's what ended up happening, which is they introduced this thing called Google News Tag. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, but basically they had introduced it to publishers as a way for everyone to play nice together. And the way that it was going to work is that because this is exactly what happens in news. The AP comes out with a wire and then everyone is publishing as if it's authentically new content, but it's not. It's the same exact thing on everyone's website. Um, and so what they came out with this Google News tag was when you publish content, if you added net new original content to it, you add this tag to it and we will give you priority in Google. But of course, as you can imagine, everyone just put that on everything that they published and therefore it was no longer relevant. But they tried to do this in like 2010, 2011 to try and get publishers to like actually tag their content as this is original and not a summary, but no one's going to like play by those rules. Hmm. Also, will you please write a history of the internet and content? Because you just jumped. Yeah, so I'm right. like, this is fascinating. <laughs> Can I listen to your podcast? And P.S. Will you make that podcast for me? Thanks so much. <laughs> it helps. God helps me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it feels like this stuff right now. Who knows where it goes in the future? It feels right. Like right now, I, I look at the generative AI tools a lot. Like I look at automation in that it's useful for reallocating your and your team's resources to more impactful, higher level critical thinking and automating redundant, repeatable stuff. And like automation, I personally tend to spend a lot of time on it when I could have just done the work itself and, and saved a ton of time by just doing the thing. But it feels like something that is much better suited towards the background of your workflow versus being like a forward facing, like, oh, we're going all in on AI generated content. It's like, well, how can we like increase the output of our content brief? Like how can we, how can we automate parts of our content briefs or our editing so we can spend more time doing things like interviewing subject matter experts and really identifying our core brand POVs and stuff like that. Is that, would, would you all agree with that? Or what do you think about that? It's like, do the boring stuff. We were thinking about like, can we use this to create like the outlines of an SEO post or whatever? And, you know, cause we like, you know, every piece that we wrote or pretty much every piece for most uh, articles came from like part S uh, SME interview and like just getting the time with that person, synthesize, you know, whatever the research that goes into it. Like I'm a big fan of that. I think that's like, actually I could have said none of those things and just said, yes, I agree. Yeah, but it's a panel. We have to, you know, pad the... I know. Like, air. why did I do that? I just, like, committed <laughs> the ultimate sin as a panelist. Yes, Alex, I agree. <laughs> I, 
I need somebody to disagree. Uh, we need we need debate to make this interesting. Um, actually, I do. We only have like seven, eight minutes left or something like that. So I'd love to do another difficult question, um, another esoteric one. But uh, what's something that you believe about content marketing that most people would disagree with you on? What's, what's your most contrarian view about content marketing? I feel like I've said a lot of contrarian things already. Okay, fine. Well, this was more. the thing that Allie and I were supposed to talk about, which is like, I don't, and this is something that, to be fair, Ashley and I have also talked about. I was like, I don't believe in playbooks. And she talks about sort of like frameworks and the idea of playbook playbooks versus frameworks. Um, but I've just seen like, things like the journey, right? Like that obscene journey map where it's like the arrows of the various places and you have those like squiggly lines on top that like show you this like obscure customer journey. And it's like, I think things like that is where I break in terms of, you know, like there's no one content strategy to rule them all. I think is like my thing It's like, you can't, it used to be that that was true. Like HubSpot did legitimately teach me my job. Um, it was like them, customer IO, sprout social moz right like and it used to be true that there was and it used to work and it doesn't anymore and the only reason you would know that it doesn't is if you followed it in the first place which is why that stuff still works right it's like you need to learn the wheel before you can break it but i like i really don't i think that like you can point to a million strategies that are being executed right now that would contradict what i'm saying obviously but I just don't fit, like, I think that there is, if you like took a step back and looked at each company individually, I think that you would, there would be many, many playbooks instead of just like this one idea of the customer journey or the funnel, right? Like what you were saying, I don't remember which one of you said it about like, yeah, it's, it's a good example for people who don't know anything about marketing, but as marketers, like, why are we using it with each other? We know it's more complicated than that. We know the journey is more nuanced than that. It's usually like, I was talking about it the other day and I was like, you, people show me this linear journey. It's like a subway map in New York. Like that's what a journey actually is. And so I think that like, you know, um, it's never satisfying to talk about because everybody just wants an answer that's really simple. But the conversations that I think are most interesting and fruitful and have the, the uh, possibility to evolve marketing as it stands today are the ones that don't have a simple answer. And if we talk, you know what I mean? Like talking more on a case study basis versus like, this is the one strategy to rule them all. Yeah. You know, when you put it like that, it sounds a whole lot less contrarian. Like you're just saying things are nuanced. <laughs> yes. Like nobody wants to hear that. Like every, like yeah. you know, I was just working for this giant client and they were like, they think they like the idea. But then when you come back to it, they're like, but show me a journey, like one journey, like show me the same, like they just want to see the same thing. So it's like, it seems, yeah, like it seems logical and pretty basic, but actually when you go to the point of execution, that's not, it is actually contrarian because nobody yeah. really wants it. No, I agree. Yeah. I'd say mine is that not everyone needs to be a creator <laughs> and I'm kind of sick of everyone being a creator. Um, there's like this deluge of information online and anyone who's ever been a leader or done something for more than three years is now an expert on it. Um, it's kind of like my, I've always had this pet peeve with travel bloggers. Like if you've been to a place once, like, is that enough information? Like, is that, you know what I mean? Like, I'm glad you had a great time, but like, I would love to hear from someone who went to that place 10 times. Like, tell me you live there and you've done like 50,000 things. Like, cool, you had one great week there. Um, and so I feel the same thing with creators. And the reason is because they share their experience as if it's something that's applicable to all. 
And that I think is what like every single answer we've given on this panel has been like, well, it depends on your business. It depends on your customers. It depends on this. And then a creator comes in and is like, well, I've done this for <laughs> two companies and therefore this is the only way to do things. Like I was at HubSpot and I'm saying right now that is not the only way to do things, but it works really well for them. And so I am really sick of creators. I'm really sick of companies being like, oh, but how do we make our newsletter like this creator? Or how do we make our blog more entertaining? And like, how do we do that? I'm like, we don't need, we are a business <laughs> and we should act and behave like a business um you know like i think no no shade to this payroll provider but like when i was running my startup this payroll provider had all these cutesy little memos all over their pair like congrats you just like successfully like did payroll it's whatever it was called and i was like i pushed a few buttons and i do it every every two weeks like i don't need to be celebrated for this and so i just feel like every cop like everyone wants to do creator work and you want to do casual voice and you want to do all this fun entertaining stuff and it's like we're not netflix we're we are business bloggers like treat it as such <laughs> You had two takes there. The, the second one actually is the underrated one about a chatty copy. I think they call it. It's like that quirky, hey, we're just like you. We're fun, we're fun and friendly. And, you know, if it's like your bank, you're like, can you chill out? <laughs> this is a little weird. But I knew. So Ali uh, Decker had the clapping emoji. And I knew you were in the background clapping at that one. Uh, Ali talks a lot about the overabundance of creators who are very strongly opinionated with not a lot to back it up. So <laughs> bravo. Allie? Mm. Um, I mean, you know my thoughts on the journey. I'm right there with Devin on that one. Um, and I guess since nobody else said it, I'll, I'll be the process nerd in the group. Um, I love processes and I love, I think it's really important to document things. And when I think playbook, I think I'm thinking frameworks. Like I love mm. frameworks. Like I don't want to come with a blank slate all the time when there are starting points that can get you there a lot faster. And so like one of them is, I love Ashley Faust's content playground that she's mm. developed. Um, I have a set of like five or six frameworks that I love and they're like my go-tos because they are flexible. Like mm -hmm. you use them as a starting point, but pull in like all the unique nuances of that business, that industry, et cetera. But like, there's something really helpful for me, maybe just the way my brain works, but I think also for like, to help bring like creativity, but like get it in like the right direction. So like, what are we trying to accomplish? Working through like messaging frameworks to start, like messaging, positioning, like who are we? What are we trying to say? What are we trying to communicate to our audience? And then like, what's gonna be the like framework of our content strategy? Because otherwise it's just really hard to get from like ideas to like, documenting what that means, how it's going to deliver business results. And that's where content gets that like bad reputation of just being a bunch of creatives that don't understand like business objectives. Also, like that is like frameworks deployed that way are extremely valuable because what you're doing is you're building it for your specific company. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. like I, that, I love frameworks because the idea is that you are crafting something that works for your unique set of circumstances, which serves the like, it depends question. When I think about playbooks, I think of those like things that people download as like a general guide for how to do things that have nothing to do with tailoring for your business and aren't really that valuable in the first place, right? Like that sort of carbon copy application of something that someone did once. And it's clearly, it's like most business books are just people who want to grow their personal brands, so they write a book. I used to write an agency that did it. Like we wrote book proposals to make people famous, right? It's like, that was part of the, the, the game. I think playbooks are the same way. What you're talking about, Allie, are extremely valuable because you're like, great, once we come up with a good idea, we have to be able to replicate this. We have to put like parameters around it. We have to be able to measure it and reflect on it so we can iterate it. That to me is like, I'm like, everyone, please, all of, all day long, right? But your yours is more sophisticated because you're saying, no, like we're doing this for us. What is our messaging framework? Yeah. What is our, you know, so it's better. Love that. Um, we could talk forever, but we're at time and we've got to listen to some music. So thank you all so much for this panel. Thanks, I hope you all enjoyed it in the audience too. Um, and actually, I think we'll still have the chat and questions. There's a bunch that I didn't address. So I might go through those and pop in some answers. But that is the panel. Yeah, we have uh, live music coming up.